Good afternoon. My name is Ruth Gorman. I work with Helen Sanderson Associates and uh, a provider organisation called Imagine Act and Succeed. So we're going to be doing our Just Enough Support uh, webinar this afternoon. Just to say right at the very beginning, I um, hope you can see on your screen there's a questions and comments uh, box. If you do have questions or comments or things that you'd like me to uh, consider an answer at the end, if you could type those uh, into that box, they will then go through uh, to Kerry who will forward them to me just so that at the end we've got time for questions and answers. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, so just enough support. Um, I suppose where to start with this really. As a, a, an organisation we started thinking about this uh, maybe two or three years ago. We could see the current climate and think about what was going on and knew that things needed to be uh, different for people. Some of the things that we, we wanted to consider was how to develop alternatives to just paid support for people. That doesn't mean that paid support is bad because it's a good thing, but how do we do some things differently uh, given the climate? How do we continue to develop individually designed services, especially at a time of reduced uh, formal support or reduced funding for people? So, you know, we've worked in person-centered ways for a number of years trying to design the right services, and there's a real danger in the current climate that people go for easy wins or easy solutions that then are not quite as person-centered uh, as we would like them to be. So just just continuing on that theme of why, um, one of the things that, that we found um, following a publication of All Together Now, which was based around um, the provider organization that I work in, we were thinking then about, you know, how can we do things differently? How can we work in partnership? How can people find some great win-win-wins and solutions for people? And I suppose Altogether Now was a very good publication, but what it didn't do was tell you how to do it. So that was a mild criticism, I think, of the paper that we developed, and that's fine. So we then thought about, well, what's the process that we use? How do we stay person-centered? And that's kind of what I'm going to talk you through. Not the whole process, but just aspects of that. Uh, today. One of the things for um, us as an organization, as a provider organization, was thinking about that real sense of purpose and drive for the staff. Um, people had been used to working in a certain way and sometimes people possibly got complacent uh, around what they do and how they do it. So it was really back to the drawing board and uh, stripping that back. I suppose another reason why for me was thinking about, you know, in doing lots of working together for change both in our organization and in lots and lots of other places, and one of the things that keeps coming through is that people are still lonely or people have less meaningful long-term relationships in their life. And yet there have been millions and millions of pounds that have, have been providing support for people for years. So it's really about thinking we need to do something different. How do we really put an emphasis on community connecting uh, and find a balance? When, when we've been doing this work and talking to uh, people, families, staff, commissioners, there's, there's a real danger that people have an understanding that just enough support is about stripping away uh, everything from people's lives. It is about starting from scratch again and, and looking at what does the person want, need, and um, you know need to have in the life and when. Um, but it's also about have we maximised people's relationships, connections, and done some uh, some fantastic work uh, around that. I saw this image um, for me kind of sums up some of our findings uh, as an organisation. I think because we have positive regard for people and we care about people uh, greatly, there has been a real danger <coughs> excuse me, that we've over-supported people for a number of years. And that's just by the very nature that we 
uh, had block contracts and people have kind of lived in that way rather than individually designed services that say what the person wants and needs. I think that, that we've had to have a bit of a realisation check about believing in people's capacity. Because when we started this work in the organisation, some of the comments that you heard from people, uh, the staff and families was, well, I'm not sure that uh, people are capable of doing that and, and how does that work for people. So I think a real sense of believing in people's capacity and testing some of that out is really, really important. And I, and I think equally people not being captors of services. Um, people seem to, to kind of need some support at some time in their life. And then very rarely do you see people come out of the other side or see people reduce the support that they have. And if we are going to be true to, to being person-centered and doing this in the right way, then we, we really need to think about that and put some energy into it. That said, we also need to balance this against risk because if, uh, you know, when I, when I talk to families and, and in particular family members who their son, daughter, brother, sister might have been receiving support for the last 20, 30 years in a certain way, when you start to talk about reducing some of that or doing things differently, people get really, really worried uh, about that and I absolutely understand that. For me, this is about how do we truly engage with uh, people and families and the staff and the culture of organizations because this is a completely different way of working and we're asking staff equally who might have been working in a certain way for a number of years uh, to do something radically different and to take some real risks and chances. But equally that works the same with commissioners uh, and care, manage, care management teams and, and people who work in local authorities. We found that there are times we've had to challenge some of those perceptions where they you know, might want us to, to make some efficiency savings but are not really prepared to take some of the risks. So we've really had to do the partnership approach to ensure that people feel safe uh, around doing some of this. So I'm just going to talk through this graphic really uh, quickly. When we talk about just enough support, we need to think about why do people need support? What do they need it for? And when do they need it? We supported lots of people, and I'm sure it's the same in lots and lots of localities where people live alongside other people who may receive 24-hour support or, you know, there are staff around most of the time, but actually they don't. <laughs> So we, we really need to unpick it and start again and, and think about that. We need to think about who is in somebody's life in terms of relationships. So people and communities. Who, who's in somebody's family and close friends? And I'm going to talk you through a, a different way of doing relationship mapping uh, in, a, in a short while. But I think a real untapped resource, something that we've not put enough energy into, is neighbours and acquaintances, people who live in the same street, people who are close to each other, and community facilities and initiatives that are going on. And there are lots of community facilities and initiatives well, that are untapped or unused that we can really kind of do some great work in. So in Wigan there's a great initiative called You'll Never Watch Alone, and that's why people with a, a, a disability can be supported by a volunteer to be at the football or the rugby. Uh, that's not a paid volunteer, it's somebody who equally likes the football and rugby and gets something, uh, some enjoyment from that. But it also stops us over-supporting people uh, as well, so it, it kind of cuts back around some of that. And when I think about kind of the facilities, there are lots of facilities not being used that could be used uh, in a very, very different way. People could be doing things together um, and doing positive things. We're going to look at the person's gifts and contributions and think about opportunities for people to build up uh, reciprocal relationships. So the things that we kind of uh, do in terms of doing favours for each other, how can you do a favour 
for somebody that isn't necessarily paid. I think that's one of the criticisms uh, of services is that people have stopped doing things uh, for each other as favours because it's always seemed to be a paid role that should be doing that. And kind of falling out of that, you know, it is thinking about who's, who's in somebody's life, who are the neighbours, where does the person go, but equally what are the staff networks, how can we tap into that differently and, and look at staff networks and gifts and strengths and share some of that. Well, on the left hand side you've got assistive technology. Um, we, we have to figure this in now and, and people talk about assistive technology as being something that uh, is specialist and is only for people with a disability. Assistive technology can be a mobile phone or something that simple. But we've really, really invested uh, in that, uh, in the Just Checking system and that's been so, so helpful in helping us think about, you know, how are people getting on if there are not staff around doing some of that checking and observing that. And it's not Big Brother watching you, you know, it's not video cameras, it's, it's a computer system that kind of tells you uh, things around movement um, and, and, and all the other assistive technology. But again, I will tell you some stories uh, around some of that in a little while. And then we've got the arm around paid support. You know, when we've looked at um, assistive technology in people and community, some people will still need paid support. That's an absolute reality. But equally, the paid support needs to be flexible and it needs to be efficient. Uh, long gone are the staff uh, hours that, that, sorry, the hours that match the staff best rather than the person. There will be a lot more uh, shorter shifts where people don't need somebody sat around while they're watching Coronation Street or, you know, <laughs> doing some of that. So that, that's been a really, really strong message that we needed uh, to send to staff. But I suppose in with that is the best match. Who, who are the people who are the best match if we're going to be doing this really well? And matching staff. Um, yeah, so matching staff appropriately, I suppose. So I'm just going to introduce you to Paul. Paul is um, somebody who I've known for a long time. Paul um, spent a lot, many, many, many years of his life uh, in a long stay hospital. And um, I helped to, to resettle Paul probably six years ago. When I first met him, he was seen to be somebody who um, was known to challenge services um, and you know needed very, very careful support. So we developed Paul's one-page profile uh, with him back then, and obviously that as one-page profile do, that changed uh, as time's gone on. But Paul moved into his own tenancy, and that was really important to him, and he also uh, helped to recruit his own staff. And again, that was something that was really, really uh, important to, to Paul. And this is where we start the process. We need to start with what do we like about people, you know, and admire, what's important to the person and how best to support. That's the way that we build uh, on some of the work that, that needs to happen uh, for people. And just, yeah, so for Paul, some of the things that people like about him is, you know, he's helpful and caring and he's a gent. Um, He's a responsible pet owner, a friendly and approachable. So there are many, many things. He's a good gardener. Um, and what's important to him, his dog is very important to him. Uh, his family and, and Edna and, and you know many other things. And this is not his complete one-page profile. These are things that he said that we can use uh, within this presentation. And how best to support him. Uh, very important for Paul. He's got to be involved in all decisions to make new friends in his community, support him around health issues. Uh, and, you know, he likes to bet and he likes to smoke, but don't nag him <laughs> about that. So Paul was the first person we started this process with and very much came from him saying that he uh, wanted to be like everybody else. And when I asked him what did that mean, he said, I, I don't want staff with me all the time. And if you think, you know, when I look back in, into Paul's uh, 
like when I first met him, there was, there was a very different uh, way that people described Paul then to how he's described now. So he's, he's come a long way, which is great. So in terms of relationships, one of the things that I think we have to start with, but it's quite difficult for people to get their head around initially, is doing a relationship map that has uh, neighbours as a section, who's a person's neighbours, and that's not the directly left and right uh, to, to where you live, but in your local kind of locality and vicinity, next couple of streets even, who's uh, in the person's family and who are the person's friends, and we know by that we mean unpaid relationships in people's lives. This is a way of stripping it back and seeing that if we took away the paid support or the paid people in people's lives, what would that look like? And some people, when we've been doing this, have said it feels really sad. There's not much there when we take it away. Well, that kind of tells me we've got an awful lot of work to do in uh, respect of relationships and connections for people. So, um, you know, Poles is not that uh, full, but he's got quite a you know, few people in there that he's happy to share with us. So he's got his neighbours, um, David Frank and Allison. He's got his friends, Edna, Barry at the Bookies, Jackie, David and Joan. And he's got his nephew uh, in New Zealand. One of the things we can't do is be making people up or putting people in that are not there. You know, and, and sadly for Paul, he has no other family than his nephew in New Zealand. So that, that's a reality uh, for him. But it also makes us think, okay, what else do we need to do? How do we harness these relationships for people and ensure that people have a good and full life? We then think about what's working and not working about where the person lives right now. And I, I just see this is absolutely key. Where you live can be the absolute barrier uh, to you having a different life. And who you live with can also be the absolute barrier. And a lot of people uh, could be living with people that maybe they're not compatible with or they live with that person and that person needs lots of support and they don't. Or if they lived in a different way then that could really, really uh, help them to, to kind of move on. Now, for Paul, he was in a, he's in a very uh, positive position because he does live on his own and, and has done from uh, the beginning. But some of the things that are not working for him is about being all protected, not having time on his own, feeling like he's not got much independence and friends, and not doing things in his own local community. We, we then, when we thought about who's the person with the one-page profile, who's in somebody's life, and the current reality about what's working, not working. I do this exercise with people. And this, for me, is something that really gives us the indication of what's going on uh, for people. So down the left-hand side, you'll see we've got hour-by-hour timings from 7 a.m. through to 6 a.m. the day after. I get people to, to think about what are the hours or what is the budget that is currently spent uh, around this person. And sometimes people don't know in terms of budget, and it might be hours as part of an assignment. Well, that's fine. We put that in as well. And then asking people to um, consider what does the person do hour by hour. So, you know, they, they start to kind of list that in there. Once people have done that, I get them to uh, think about well, what's the current reality. Are people currently receiving paid support for all this time? So if somebody is living in a 24-hour tenancy or in that kind of environment, then, then that's the reality for people. And we think about, in terms of being a critical friend with each other, okay, so if the person is doing whatever they're doing at that time, could they do that without support? So, you know, you could tick or question mark the no support box. Could they do that with natural or unpaid support, including volunteers? Again, question mark or ticks in that. Are there assist is there assistive technology that could help with this? 
And it's really important to have an assisted technology lead in your local authority or in your organization so that you can link in with that person because the technology is changing rapidly. And does the person still need paid support to do that part of the day? And if the person does, um, that, that's absolutely fine, but we need the justification for that. Not just that there's a risk, tell us what the risk is and let's justify it together. And I ask people to uh, do critical friends with each other at this point because I think we can really struggle to um, challenge ourselves with something radically different. And this is radical change for some people. Some of the things that we've found are the most significant shifts, and it's been a real driver in our organization, has been the overnight support. And that's come from, from doing this. You know, people kind of uh, put in that at 10 o'clock, let's say, uh, people go to bed, and they don't get up until 8 or 9 o'clock the day after. OK, so what do they do while they sleep? Well, that's great. We all see people to sleep when they go to bed. So what are you doing? Well, I'm at your sleep in the next bedroom. OK, so why are you with her? You know, and it really starts asking that question. So for Paul, who I introduced you to earlier, one of the things that, that people were saying about Paul is, well, he's got epilepsy and he smokes. So we've got two big risk issues. So we must keep the overnight support and the overnight support for him is asleep in. So I then sat down with the staff team and we went through this and I said, okay, explain to me what happens. And he said, well, Paul goes out with his dog in the, in the garden. He'll have his last cigarette and he chooses to smoke outside. It's, you know, what he's always done. He'll come in, he'll lock up and then he'll go to bed uh, and we'll see him the day after when he gets up. So nobody checks on him at night. Um, and that just raised the question for me, well, you mentioned that epilepsy is an issue. How would you know if he had had a seizure? And people were just very quiet because they just realized they were in the next bedroom, but they wouldn't necessarily know if he'd had a seizure. So Peter doesn't have sleeps now, and, and he has a, an epilepsy center in his bed that goes through to my own call system that alerts people immediately if, if people need to do anything, if he's, if he's having a seizure. And I think, you know, when you talk to Peter, he's so much happier uh, around that. We, we've reduced now um, nine sleeps in one area because that kind of it became a bit of a, a rolling ball in a very, very positive way. People were um, up for the challenge. It, it took time to uh, do this with the first person. But when we did, we've just seen such fantastic outcomes from this. I did have a couple of um, videos that I've put into the uh, presentation today, but sadly we can't see them on webinar. Um, but you could go to uh, the website and have a look at them then. Uh, they're on the website. So yeah, we, we've looked at this for a number of people, and people have shocked and astounded us um, with how able and capable people are. On Friday of last week, I was um, talking to three people who live together, and they, they've had their overnight support reduced. And one of the ladies um, was telling me that she'd actually um, pressed the button for on-call, for the on-call system. Um, as one of the people that she lived with needed some assistance in the middle of the night. So that for me is just absolutely um, astounding. So this very simple kind of um, chart starts to help us really think about what are we there for? And, you know, I've, I've heard people with support talk about um, it's like having a babysitter or a jailer, and they don't mean that in a disrespectful way but somebody always in your home with you all the time, maybe when you're watching a film or watching TV in the evening, isn't necessarily uh, what people want. And I suppose just to say a little bit about the technology while we're, we're still on this screen, it's technology and sometimes things will go wrong with technology and we've seen that. 
So in the um, area that I was talking about where we reduced all the sleepings and we have the um, we have telecare that goes through to our duty managers, uh, we received a call one night to say that the telecare system had crashed completely. Um, and so all these people who use telecare didn't have any way of kind of contacting us or the usual way of contacting us. Now, we could have done two things. We, we could have said, right, everybody's in at risk. Let's put sleepings in in those houses as a, a one-off, as an overnight uh, safety net. Or we could go and visit each one of those houses and, and talk to the people there and see if there's something different we could do. And that's what we did. And, and people were brilliant. You know, people didn't need or didn't want, most importantly, a staff coming back in and spending uh, the night with them. Just to say as well, one of the things around um, contingencies and putting contingencies in place, um, we put contingencies in place around one situation where a lady had a bed sensor because her family were worried uh, that if she got up in the middle of the night, uh, maybe she, you know, she'd be at risk and wouldn't go back to bed. You know, we've got door sensors on the front and back door. All those things are, are in place for her. Um, and we started to get a regular 3 a.m. call out. And so the uh, the team leaders who were the duty managers were saying, this just isn't working. Uh, Deborah, this, this lady, is sat watching TV and she's got a cup of tea when we arrive at 3 a.m. And when we asked Deborah, she actually said she wanted to watch TV at 3 a.m. <laughs> so we we put something in place that was kind of getting in the way for her and that's now reduced. So again, you know, great contingency that we had at the time, but um, it was starting to stifle the people with support. And and she was telling us very clearly that she didn't want us there at 3 a.m. She liked that time uh, on her own at night. We we think about people's gifts and contributions, and I know we do that with one-page profiles, but this is kind of just drilling a little bit deeper and thinking about what are people's gifts, talents, and contributions? Have we really, really looked at that? And what are the resources that people have that they can share? The biggest resource a lot of the people that we support have is time. People have got time on their hands, and how do we use the gifts and talents so that that can then uh, kind of be a contributing factor to the local community, to the people uh, in the neighborhood, you know, in whatever way makes sense. So for Paul, uh, as you can see, there are lots of things that um, are his gifts, talents, and contributions. He's got great resources because he also has a car and he's, he's got a willingness. You know, he, he goes shopping, so could shop for other people as well. And then the team we're thinking about, well, where could that thrive? You know, he, he's very good at putting the bet on. He could go to the, the betting shop, shop for neighbors, uh, walk other people's dogs, and give people lists. But it's also thinking outside that box as well. We, we support a lady who people were really struggling to think about this. A uh, lady who uses an electric wheelchair, doesn't use words to speak. And people started to talk about, OK, let's turn it on its head a little bit and think, well, what does the local community need? You know, what can she offer the local community? And one of the staff started to talk about how when um, it, it was kind of October, November time, uh, it's really difficult, isn't it, when you order your Christmas presents or your parcels from Amazon and they put a card through the door and then you've got to go and collect them. So she could be a great resource to the community. So she was supported to, uh, to write all these postcards in the local neighborhood and go and pop them through the neighbor's doors. She was completely inundated with people requesting that parcels get delivered. And that wasn't abusive, that was positive. You know, it's a real positive move for her. She had more people cross her threshold and her door than ever before and got countless um, uh, invites to people's houses over the Christmas period as she'd done favors for people. So it truly is about looking at what, what are people's gifts and contributions and thinking about that kind of differently um, and, and a bit harder, I think. 
and that kind of moves us on to kind of connections and where somebody is a customer, where the person might feel good, where they're a member. Where are the places where connections can be strengthened? Where have we become a barrier <laughs> as staff when we go, go to places with people? Where can we step back a little bit from that? And where are the places where new connections could be made? Have we really, really um, opened our uh, hearts and minds, I suppose, to thinking about where people could do uh, some different things? So it's got a real, real community focus um, in kind of moving forward. But there are lots of tools that we're using just enough support, but obviously we've not got the time to talk about them uh, all today. But I think one of the things that's really important is thinking about how do we put our ideas into action. It has to be truly, true partnership working. That we have to celebrate great tries, and it has to be a no-blame culture for this to work well. Uh, people need to be informed and up to speed with what's going on. But we also have to challenge ourselves uh, around this and challenge our culture uh, and the way we work. So we do need to use the graph that's at the top to make sure that we're not moving away from what's, in, what's not important to people. It needs to stay important to people and provide just enough support uh, rather than kind of go the other way. We also need to analyze and think about what are some of the challenges and barriers before starting this work and what are some opportunities that will arise uh, as a result of this. We need to think about the impact um, and we spent quite a lot of time uh, doing this. I'll just pick out policies and procedures. What we realized pretty quickly uh, in this process was that we had some policies and procedures that we have because we have to have. Um, but they were getting in the way. So relationships and professional boundaries uh, being one of those. So we spent a good 18 months in the organization uh, co-creating uh, a new policy and procedure around that. So it doesn't, it's not you can and you can't. It's let's ask some questions and be open uh, to some new ways of working. We've had to do lots of training. Um, for the staff, so for each person that we've thought about, it's been kind of a team approach with the team leader, the family members around them, um, and that's really, really helped, but the ongoing support has to happen from that as well. And the culture and morale, um, one of my anxieties at the beginning of this, knowing that we have to uh, do things differently, and let's just take overnight support as an example, that meant staff were losing money. That's a reality. That staff weren't getting their, their pay for being in bed asleep uh, near somebody. So that needed some real careful consideration and acknowledgement straight away. But um, sadly, you can't see the videos uh, have this on of staff saying how it's so much better now to get to go home and people have grown uh, in confidence and, and that feels really, really good. So for me, this is truly about it's hard work, but it's created a win-win-win situation. The win for people because they're starting to feel more confident, um, telling you that they don't need overnight support or telling you that they've not always got somebody around um, kind of following them, basically. The win for uh, the organization in terms of, do you know what, there's a real drive, there's a real sense of purpose, there's a real understanding of what are we here to do. And the win for the, the local authority and commissioning teams because we're only providing support, the support that's needed and necessary. We're delivering on outcomes that are timely outcomes. And you know that that frees up money for more people um, in in the future. So when I'm talking to staff about this and they do the daily tracker, I've heard so many people say, um, "I've just I've just done myself out of a job because it's very obvious we're not needed." And I said, "Well, actually, you've not. You've probably just secured something for the future, which means you'll probably support 
more and different people, uh, but we'll support that person in a way that makes uh, absolute sense to them. So thank you uh, from, from myself. Um, I don't know if we have any questions that have come through to you, Kerry. So the first entry that I have for you, Ruth, is lovely example of how to introduce community to the people we support. Do you have any others? Examples? Yes. Oh, I could fill the day with the examples um, of uh, community and people we support. So, yep, I, I uh, let me think about some of the others. Um, so a, a gentleman that I was, uh, I wasn't particularly working with him, I was working with an organisation um, that supported this gentleman and they'd done some of this work and they were um, looking, I'll just go back to the slide so that you can see it, they were looking at the gifts and contributions and thinking about who this guy was and one of his gifts and contributions is playing the organ. Um, and I have met him and he plays the organ um, very much uh, from memory, all the old time classics, all the lovely kind of thing that he can do. And then people were thinking about, well, what resources can he share and where could he do some of that? I, again, you know, huge resource of time and staff. You know, we shouldn't underestimate that people have a resource of staff as well that people can do some really different things with, you know, and maybe share and connect and, and do some of that. Um, and when they were thinking about where his contribution could thrive, they then thought about, okay, you know, where, where would um, the old time classics be most appreciated? Uh, and they came up with lots of ideas, but one that was particularly close to his home was um, uh, a nursing home or a residential care home. So off the staff went, uh, and they went and they, they asked the manager of the residential care home if this was possible. And she was great, and she's a community connector, and said, yep, that's absolutely fantastic. And uh, off he went. Uh, and this is, this is a very true story. Um, it's it's a, an outstanding story as well. He was playing the organ on his first um, day of, of being there. And the, I suppose the understanding was that if he, if everything went well, he'd probably start doing that without support, uh, you know, and could be a befriender to some of the older people as well. And he was sat playing the organ, and he turned to his staff who was next to him and said, um, "Can you see the guy in the corner? That's my brother." And nobody knew that, and nobody knew that he lived two miles away from him either. So yeah, uh, I think that's. That's a wonderful story. I'd like to talk to you about Martin really quickly. Um, Martin, somebody that we support in Oldham. And again, you know, thinking about his gifts and talents, what was important to him. Martin loved to garden. That, that's something that people see as a gift. But he'd never actually grown anything in terms of fruit or veg or, you know, done anything different. So people were saying, well, you know, that's a real talent. Let, let's do some thinking about that. And then, is that something that he could do for, uh, you know, for his neighbours? Could he um, offer his neighbours some of his uh, vegetables and things? And it's so, you know, great starting point. So Martin got cracking, and and uh, they cordoned a part of the garden off so that he could uh, start to grow vegetables. That was his first thing. And then. Um, when the vegetables were grown, he'd go around to his local neighbours uh, with a kind of a, a parcel of, of veg and knock on the door and, and say, this is a gift from Martin. Martin doesn't use words to speak, so this was, you know, very much the staff being the bridge builder here, um, but Martin was obviously getting a lot from doing that. One of the neighbours um, then started to have a conversation with Martin and his staff to say, I think it's lovely that you do this, you know, and I think it, it's great that you're putting something in the community. And she uh, belonged to a church. Now, Martin goes to a different church a mile away, but she was explaining that at this church, um, they um, meet once a month, and uh, they collect fruit and veg, and they create soup, and they go into Manchester, and they do a soup kitchen for people who are homeless. 
And she was saying, well, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if Martin's um, vegetables were contributing to that? So he was actually uh, doing something that you know kind of felt meaningful, uh, more meaningful. <laughs> Giving your, your neighbour's veg, I think, is meaningful, but more meaningful. And again, that's taken off, and that you know, they then asked him to start going uh, with them into Manchester once a month uh, to do that. Now, obviously, his vegetables are not all year round, but he really, really is part of that group now and seen as an integral member of that. And uh, he's just branched out and bought some chickens, <laughs> so his, his garden's become a bit of a farm, um, and he he's doing the same thing with the eggs right now with the neighbours. I'm, I'm conscious of time and I don't know if there are any more questions. Um, I'll just pause for a second because I could just carry on with stories but I don't know. Uh, are there any more questions, Kerry? There aren't, Ruth. No, that's all of the questions. Okay. Uh, and how long do we have left? 15 minutes? Uh, you have up to an hour so if, you want, if you'd like to carry on with examples for another 15 minutes you have the time to do so. Okay. Does that work for people? Oh well, they can't go back to me, so I will assume, I will assume it does. Um, okay, so just thinking about other stories around community um, connecting. So uh, Ian is somebody that we support. He, he um, I suppose his is more around housing and using his gift in that way. Ian's a very, very helpful character and was really, really struggling to live with um, other people in a group tenancy and that was pretty apparent and his um, his elderly relative I think it was his nana lived in um, kind of a, something that's a bit like an extra care scheme uh, where there are flats and bungalows um, and he used to go and visit his uh, nana a couple of times a week and in in front of this uh, kind of development there's big piece of grass and that's where the young children not young but you know the teenage children um, on an evening weekend would con uh, congregate and with that came uh, empty bottles and crisp packets etc etc so Ian took it upon himself without being asked to do that um, that every um, week he would uh, go out there and he'd clean it all up and make it look nice and just became a real kind of core feature within uh, the extra care scheme to the point that when um, one of the uh, the flats came available uh, the the people who lived there uh, were telling Ian actually this has come available and, and what do you think which was a bit tricky because I suppose the the nature of the scheme uh, was 45 and above in terms of age limit of people who were living there and Ian didn't quite match that. So we had to do kind of lots and lots of liaising with um, the housing association around this and, and challenge some of their perceptions. But what became so wonderful is that the, the people who lived there, because Ian had been so helpful over time, had created a petition. Uh, and they'd gone to themselves independently to, to the House Association and said, well, we would actually like him to move in. He would be a fantastic uh, tenant for us to, to have living here. So I think, yeah, you know, and, and, and that works to this day for Ian. He uh, is doing so, so well. Um, and he does shopping now. So he does shopping for some of the people. and. I suppose again it's thinking about what does community need so in that community you know Ian kind of keeps his eye out for people and he doesn't stay in and watch everything that's going on he's, he's got a life but people go to Ian if they need something which I think is is a wonderful thing and I suppose for me in terms of the, the people we support a key factor in this is what sense of purpose do the people who use services have. You know, what's the driver? What gets them out of bed in the morning? What is the passion? And how can we kind of really link that and use that and use it in a way that makes absolute sense so that people are not shopping a lot 
you know, they might be doing shopping for other people and that feels absolutely a wonderful thing to do. But yeah, just, just having a real um, sense of purpose and, and something to do. I just want to tell you about um, a story where three people live together and we um, removed their overnight um, support. Because I think this is really important in terms of risk. When we were doing this, the um, staff team, it was kind of one of the second or third places, the staff team were really worried you know, how are people going to manage, uh, you know, what's going to happen here. One of the, the people who lives in Tennant was a smoker. So we had lots and lots of meetings and, uh, as I say, we put the just checking system in so that we could get a gauge while the staff were still in there of what was going on at night. And the staff were telling us, you know, their anxiety was around uh, two people, but not the third person, uh, who's Gary, because he's fine, he sleeps. Uh, all night, every night. When we put the just checking in and we started to kind of see, and you can't see people, you can see movement uh, in terms of breath, what was going on. The two people that they had the biggest concerns about slept all night long. And the one person, Gary, uh, was getting up in the middle of the night, same time every night, and going down to bed. This is a person who um, staff have said in the past, uh, needs a lot of support, uh, you know, needs a lot of help around motivation and making drinks and, and different things. So I went out to see him just to have a chat with him, you know, I said, it's fascinating, you're not in trouble or anything, I'm just really interested to know what's going on. And he told me that um, he goes downstairs and he makes a sandwich and he makes himself a, a hot drink. And then he washes everything up and puts everything away so that nobody knows he's been up. And, he goes back to bed. and that, that was kind of the pattern that we were seeing. When I asked Gary why he was doing that, and he said, well, it's the only time I ever get to be on my own. And I thought that was really, really sad, to be honest, that you know, he was thinking that he needed to do that to get some time on his own. So again, you know, real driver for me about not over supporting people and doing some of this stuff and letting people feel independent. You know, we use that word so, so much, but what does it truly mean? Independent on whose terms? And sometimes it's ours. So, yeah, um, I think kind of that's it uh, in terms of stories. I think if I do continue, we will probably still be here at five o'clock. But I am more than happy to have conversations with people. Um, Carrie, so if people wanted to email me, uh, that's fine as well. Um, and they can look at some uh, video clips on our provider organization's website. So um, I can give you that email if you email Ms. Rimley, Helen Sands Associates uh, email as well. So yeah, we've got lots of video clips. You can see this in action. You don't need to to hear me uh, talking about it. Kerry, are there any, any more questions that have come up or any no, more that's... questions subsequently from that? No, that's all of the questions, Ruth. Okay. Well, then,